chilling tales for dark nights. Home, written by Jeffrey Ebright, narrated by Otis Gyrie, featuring Mr. Creepypasta, music and audio production by Jeff Clement. The early morning sun poked through my window, let me know it was time to get to work. I yawned, stretched, and put on a pair of shorts with a t-shirt. I could hear the cardinals chirping hello to the serene August morning. It was already in the mid-sixties, which meant a very warm and humid day would be on its way. The kids would be here soon, and I needed to make sure everything was ready for the weekend. As the sun inched over the horizon and burned away the morning haze, I checked the cabins and found everything in place for the new campers. Food packed the cabinets and freezers in the mess hall, enough for a large contingent of children. This would be the last weekend of summer camp for the year. Once these kids were gone, the Monoka Nature Reserve would be shuttered and forgotten until spring returned to claim the reserve from winter's icy grip. I checked the list Roger had given me at the beginning of the camp season. I went through the list of participants and stopped at the last unchecked date. This weekend, I would help host the Boys of St. Michael's Orphanage. Sorry, we don't use the word orphanage anymore. Political correctness sent out a memo calling St. Michael's a foster child care center. It doesn't matter what name they give it. St. Michael's houses all the unwanted children from broken and abandoned families. These kids were the modern-day wretched refuse the Statue of Liberty talks about on its base. If not for the sizable donation from the Joseph Swift Foundation, these kids would never step foot in Camp Winoka, they were truly the lost souls, and if not for a few caring individuals, would have slipped through the cracks of society without concern. For most of the camping season, snot-nosed rich kids ran around Monoka like they were personally responsible for nature itself. They were privileged, spoiled, and couldn't give a rat's ass about communing with nature and its wonders, the upside to those little rich kids was the money their parents shelled out for us to entertain and amuse their rotten brats for a week. Their cash kept Camp Winoka running and afforded the opportunity to bring in less fortunate kids for camp. Although most of these young souls had never been out of the city, they appreciated the commune with forest life. After 30 years as camp caretaker, this was my payment, seeing the wonder in their eyes when presented with the majesty of nature. With everything in order, I jumped on the camp's ATV and drove back to my Airstream trailer and nestled off the camp proper. Looking in my bathroom mirror, I was a little unkempt. I swept back my salt and pepper hair, tied a rubber band around my ponytail, brushed out my beard, dabbed on some deodorant and slipped into a clean yellow polo shirt with the camp crest. It was about 8 a.m. and the camp would come to life with new explorers soon. I fired up the ATV and went to base camp to await the last campers of the season. 
I had just finished a Red Delicious when I heard the bus rolling down the dirt road. The Winoka Nature Reserve was an isolated slice of forest in the southeast corner of Ohio. It covered over 400 acres of privately protected woods and wildlife. Hiking trails wound through the forest without a telephone pole or a skyscraper littering the landscape. The cabins, mess hall, and even the suspension bridge across Taylor Ravine were all built with solid 19th century ingenuity. A single dirt road was the only way in or out of the reserve. Roger was the first off the bus. As usual, he was filled with energy and covered in summer sweat. Although most counselors were teenagers trying to add a community service star to their college transcript, Roger had fallen in love with Camp Winoka and decided to make it a yearly commitment. He was an able-bodied guy, so I appreciated the help. Jackson! How's it going, you old mountain man? Roger thrust out a hand. I shook it. Everything's primed and ready to roll, Roger. While the other counselors tended to the kids, Roger slung an arm around my neck and walked me away from the unloading bus. Listen, Jackson... There are 22 kids this year, all boys, so we can use cabins A, B, C, and we'll leave cabin D empty. There's a couple rowdy ones, but nothing we can't handle. After all, if we can't handle two dozen kids for three days, we're in the wrong business. (laughs) He laughed and looked at me with a concerned expression. How's your arthritis? Uh, Good days and bad, Roger, I supplied, but nothing to keep me out of the game. Good to hear. I'll get with you when the kids are done settling in, and we can go over the schedule. Here's to a great weekend! (laughs) He slapped me on the back and returned to the bus. The kids unloaded and settled into their assigned cabins without incident. From the checklist Roger gave me, the kids were 9 to 13 years old, most in the lower part of the age range. Just like every year, we gathered them together in the mess hall for introductions before lunch. Good afternoon, campers! Roger cheerfully bellowed. He was met with a semi-enthusiastic hello by the campers. My name is Roger Lovek, but you can call me Roger. I'm the head counselor for your stay at Camp Winnica, and this... He pointed to the four yellow-shirted counselors. ...is Gary, Glenn, Mitch, and Tom. And this is Mountain Man Jackson. He pointed to me. He takes care of the campground all year long and keeps it looking great. If you ever have any problems during your stay, please let myself or one of these men know. We are here to make sure that you have fun and stay safe. Roger glanced to his clipboard. With that in mind, we do have a few rules. The children heaved a collective sigh. Come on, guys. The rules are here for your protection. The nearest city is 45 minutes away. The nearest hospital is over an hour. Play safe. Stay safe. Right? Rule number one. Everyone needs to be in their assigned cabin by 9 o'clock. When you're in the wilderness, the temperature drops about 20 degrees once the sun sets. Unlike the city, there's no street lights. It gets really dark and very cold quickly. Rule number two. Every camper will be assigned a buddy. Your buddy is to be with you at all times. Well, unless you're going to the bathroom. (laughs) Everybody chuckled at this. Rule three. Unless you're being led by a counselor, stick to the blue paths. If you look at your packets, you'll see the paths I'm talking about. Blue paths are safe to walk with your buddy. Red paths are trails approved for walking only when a counselor is with you. The black paths are off limits and are for staff members only. Rule number four. Trail bikes, paddle boats, and canoes are available on a first-come first serve basis. The sign-up sheet is located on the bulletin board outside the main cabin. We put up a new sheet after dinner for the next day of unscheduled activity time. And, before you ask, the ATV is for counselor use only. Rule number five, be respectful of your counselors and fellow campers. We have opened this once-in-a-lifetime chance to enjoy nature. Take advantage of it, not the people around you, and you'll have a great time. What do you say? The kids offered a civil round of applause. Roger waited for the smattering to die down. And this year, we are offering a special surprise to the best campers. We will be choosing six of the best campers for a Sunday night excursion to the Light of Hope Ruins. Some kids smiled and nodded. 
I can see some of you know the legend. We'll be camping there for the night with an open pit cookout, s'mores, and maybe, just maybe, do a little ghost hunting. How does that sound? The kids erupted in applause and whistles. I couldn't help but chuckle to myself. Great! Be on your best behavior, and you can be one of the chosen few. Now, let's all get in line for lunch. We have a lot to see today. The kids continued to applaud as they lined up for the afternoon meal. I never minded putting meals together when I was in the Army, so it was an easy task. Every day, one of the counselors was assigned to KP with me. Unfortunately, they usually bitched and moaned about it. I never understood that attitude. I mean, get it over with. Don't drag it out by complaining the whole time. Besides, these kids were grateful to have a bologna sandwich, fruit cup, and celery with peanut butter. It was those rich kids that had special menu requests that was the real pain. Needless to say, there are no vegetarians when you're poor. The next couple of days flew by without incident. I'll be honest, I've never seen a group of lightly supervised kids not get into a little mischief when the counselor wasn't around. I guess the Light of Hope camp was a real draw. For those of you who do not watch those ghost hunting programs, the Light of Hope ruins are one of those places that have spawned many supernatural myths around them. This made life hellish for me. Matter of fact, I spent the majority of my off-season time running off idiots with their ghost-detecting equipment because if anyone gets hurt, the sanctuary would be liable for any injuries sustained. However, it never stopped anyone from spinning a yarn about a campfire or two about the place the media calls Gore and Orphanage. Light of Hope was located three-quarters of a mile from the main campground, close to the interstate annex. The six winners were easy to choose and were elated when we called their names at the Saturday night assembly. The kids were a bit skittish due to the fact that we had to take one of the black paths through the dense woods, but Roger and I made sure they tucked their pant legs into their socks to prevent ticks and chiggers from getting a free ride to the campsite. Mr. Jackson, what's that? Close to the campsite, a kid named Connor Watson pointed into the woods where a clearing appeared. See those old markers? That was a graveyard over a hundred years ago, I said. That's creepy. The boy had a worried face as I patted his head. Don't worry, Connor. Ghosts don't exist. You're safe. For now. I offered him a wink. We made the site about an hour before sunset and set to the task of putting up the two tents. Each tent could fit eight people comfortably, but were a bit of a pain to set up due to the remnants of brick and stone left from a hundred years ago. By the time we had them up, the sun had mostly melted into the horizon. The six winners were a bit rowdy and anxious, but we kept them occupied. Roger took half the kids out to forge wood for the campfire, while I took the other half to help prepare dinner. Although Connor was not too happy about deer stew, the others were unaffected. Mark Treasure acted as almost ghoulish in his desire to try it. We set the gallon pot above a healthy fire. Even though every kid was thinking about gore orphanage, none of them asked about it. By the time we were ready for s'mores, they were practically chomping at the bit for a ghost story. I served the kids some homemade apple cider I warmed over the fire to keep the cold away while they finished their chocolate graham cracker marshmallow treats. Roger decided he would begin weaving the supernatural tale. So, has anyone ever heard of Gore Orphanage? All hands went up. But does anyone know why it's called Gore Orphanage? Most of the kids shrugged. Well, back in the late 1800s, there was an orphanage located on this very spot. You see the bricks and timbers lying around our campsite, right? They all nodded. It was once a huge building that housed almost 200 children. It was originally called the Light of Hope Orphanage. I jumped in. These kids they took in weren't good kids like you. They were mostly runaways and kids that weren't right in the head. 
and some were downright mean. But they were too young to go to prison, so the authorities put in light of hope for rehabilitation. You kids know about what that means. Some nodded, intent for listening. That means they hoped the orphanage could help them become good, productive citizens. But some couldn't be rehabilitated. Roger sighed. Some children were dangerous and had to be chained up at bedtime. Some children were locked downstairs in the basement and were only allowed out for an hour a day. The worst of them were isolated in small, lightless parts of the basement and never allowed to play with other children. The worst of them was a kid by the name of Lowell Frudge. I continued. Think of the meanest kid you know. Now, times that kid by ten. That's how mean he was. Nobody knows what made him so mean, or if he was born with the spirit of the devil with him. His first night in Light of Hope, he bit off another kid's ear. They tried chaining him, but he'd picked the locks and hurt other kids. So they put him downstairs where he got free again. This time he hurt a kid so bad that by the time the orderlies got him to the infirmary, the kid was almost dead. Lowell had broken every finger and toe on the kid, joint by joint, added Roger. And then he started on the kid's limbs, snapping his arms and legs one by one. Roger accentuated this by breaking some dry sticks and tossing them into the campfire. As you can guess... Lowell had become far too dangerous to leave around other kids, I offered. The people in charge decided to lock him away in the basement. They put him in a straitjacket and only let him out for a shower once a month. When they let him to take a shower, they'd also wash down his cell. Let's just say he didn't have the cleanest of bathroom habits. But how did he eat? Connor, the youngest of the winners, asked. Good question. Once a day, an orderly would bring in a bottle of liquid food, oatmeal or gruel, and force a tube down his throat. They'd empty the bottle straight into his stomach. That method worked until he bit off one of the orderly's fingers. After that, they had to strap him down to feed him. Ah, come on! Mark Traeger, the oldest of the winners, rolled his eyes in disbelief. It's true. A quick, serious look put Mark's doubt in check. They used an old, rusty sea clamp to force his mouth open. Lowell fought them, but only succeeded in breaking off pieces of his teeth. They found records where orderlies refused to feed Lowell because of his creepy, jagged tooth smile. Oh yeah, I forgot about that, Jackson. <coughs> Roger hid in a laugh at my improvisation behind a cough. Everyone that came in contact with Lowell Frud was convinced that he had the devil in him. But what could they do? The only way to leave the orphanage was either through an adoption or when they turned 18. People knew no one would adopt Lowell. And it was many years before he was old enough to legally leave. So in that small basement cell, he stayed. And years passed. Roger suddenly stood up. Sorry, boys. I have to go relieve myself. Jackson, do you mind finishing the story? I don't know, Roger. Do you think they can handle the rest of the story? To this, the children responded with a chorus of protests. Okay, okay, okay. I'll tell you the rest of the story, as long as you guys promise to clean up afterward and hit the bed. Deal? All agreed, and I passed around the rest of this steaming apple cider while Roger headed into the woods for privacy. After a few years in the hole, the people who ran the orphanage relaxed and let Lowell out of the straitjacket. They even let him eat real food instead of pouring gruel down his throat. It looked like he might have been turning the corner and was going to make a good citizen after all. However, he had these eyes that looked like they housed the fires of hell. It unnerved everyone who met him. But he was behaving, so he got more and more privileges back, although he was still kept in the basement. Then, on an August night in 1910, a night like this one, it happened. Lowell Frud picked the locks on his shackles. Any other person held prisoner for years would have made for the doors and escaped, but not Lowell. 
he went to the storage shed and got several cans of kerosene. Back then, kerosene was used in lamps instead of the light bulbs that we use today. He crept through the night, pouring gallon upon gallon of kerosene all around the building, in the hallways and any other place he could move without drawing attention to himself. He poured a final trail of kerosene out the main doors and wedged a piece of lumber across the doors, jamming them closed. And then he put a match to the kerosene. The boys gasped. They were hooked. And in that dark night, much like this night, Lowell Fred laughed as he watched the orderlies and children helplessly pound on the doors and windows as the flames grew taller and hotter. Survivors say he sat down on the front lawn and watched it all burn to the ground, his red eyes glowing, smiling his broken smile. What a bunch of bull, offered Mark. You think so? I asked. Here are the facts, young man. On that August night, 172 children and employees died, burned alive. Only 17 children and an orderly survived. By the time fire trucks responded, it was too late. All the firemen could do was watch the Light of Hope orphanage burn to the ground and listen to the dying screams of the trapped orphans. In case you've forgotten, you're sleeping in the ruins of Gore Orphanage. Oh, there's one other fact I should share. The children all held their breath when they asked in unison, What? Lowell Fred's body was never found. The local sheriff's office searched the woods for a week, but they found no survivors, nor did they find Lowell Fred. The only trace of Lowell was where the survivor said he was sitting on the lawn. A single word was burned into the grass. Home. People say Lowell Fred roamed the Winoka woods like an animal, wild animal, until his dying day. Some say his spirit still haunts these woods. And on certain nights, I'd like this one, you can hear the wailing of the orphan children warning the living when Lowell Fred is lurking about. Wait. Listen. The kids looked at each other as the night sky covered the woods in darkness. Only the occasional crackling of the fire interrupted the silence. Almost on cue, a thin, high-pitched moan filtered through the surrounding trees. Wh what was that? Connor sputtered. I have no idea, I said flatly. Just stay near the fire. It was then I saw Connor, mouth wide open, pointing toward the woods. One by one, the other kids followed his finger. In the tree line, two small red orbs the size of human eyes glowed. And from the thing in the tree line came a single guttural word. The children froze. Their panic drenched the area. The thing advanced again and they all began shrieking, but huddled close to the fire. Mark even bowled a partially burning stick from the campfire and held it in front of him. It repeated, drawing closer to the campsite. The children were seconds away from blind panic. I exclaimed, Lowell Fred, it can't be! The thing burst from the tree line and into the light of the campfire. The children offered one more unified scream before realization hit them. It was Roger. Gotcha! <laughs> he laughed, walking up to the campfire. He showed them his glasses with the red LED lights and sat down on the log next to the fire. You kids should know better. I couldn't contain my laughter. Ghosts don't exist. The kids offered weak protests to the prank, but Roger and I couldn't stop laughing. Once the adrenaline surge died down, the kids complied to our wishes and went to their tents. Roger and I made sure all the boys were secure in their sleeping bags before we returned to the fire. That worked better than I thought, said Roger. I didn't believe you about the moaning thing. 
Earlier that week, I had told Roger about how the trucks driving the interstate close to Gore Orphanage caused a sound which, when filtered through the dense forest, sounded like another worldly moaning. Many paranormal investigators reported it as evidence of ghosts, but it was quickly debunked as passing big rigs. However, we were going to take advantage of any free story elements we could. Did everybody have their fill of cider? Roger looked at the stack of empty cups. No problem there. I stood and stretched. We got a big day tomorrow. Game over. Is it? Roger smiled. The kids slept like logs. Roger and I found it difficult to wake them up, in fact. I guess I had put too many sleeping pills in the apple cider. The next morning, the kids made their groggy way back to the main camp and prepared for the return to St. Michael's. I smiled and waved at children whose names I would soon forget. Well, maybe I'd remember one. I'm sure the bus ride back to St. Michael's was uneventful, with the exception of the winners regaining their wits long enough to ask where their fellow orphan was. Roger would handle it with his usual charm, like he had done in the previous years. Probably some excuse like an asthma attack, spider bite from a brown recluse, or some such nonsense. It didn't really matter. There was always a new batch of bright-eyed junior counselors every year. A missing child on the books meant an additional $60,000 went straight into the administrator's pocket. All the angles were covered. Orphans are the lost souls of society, and would never be missed. Roger joined me later that day. We strolled into a cabin, Cabin D, with uncontrollable grins. Connor Watson, eyes a mixture of uncertainty and terror, lay bound and weeping in the corner of the cabin. I told you, Connor, ghosts don't exist. But monsters? Monsters are real. I drew my knife and closed the cabin door.